She's an active organizer with Decarcerate Pennsylvania and is Decarcerate UK and is co-founder of Address This Social Justice Correspondence Courses for Individual Incarcerated in Pennsylvania. She's also the recipient of a, a Pew Fellowship this year, um, which I said to Emily, I think it's important to say because here is a person who has worked on the ground for a really long time and that 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 there are some recognitions for that kind of work of uh, grassroots activism uh, is probably meaningful to all of us who are doing that work. So, um, Emily is a recipient of the Pew Fellowship here, which is amazing, and it's been able to do some different work than um, the before from us. Um, I've been teaching uh, Emily's, uh, a piece of Emily's called Muzzled Last uh for a long time, and I'm very excited, uh, which is a, um, a a piece in, in a wonderful uh, collection called Refuge Refugee, edited, edited by Jenna Austin, and that looks at um, the relationship of con the containment of refugees and like uh, nature refuge, which is more or less, I mean, that's sort of the frame of refugee. And um, in Emily's piece, she uh, does so much of what I really appreciate about her work. There's so much collection of um, archival material, there's field notes, there's, and there's um, play with language that ruptures the very mechanisms of, for example, the, the sort of murderous autobahn methods of, of listing and containment, which required so much murder of um, flying creatures, um, and, um, and turns them on their head with a kind of uh, amplification to what I've been thinking of all day. And, um, it, language amplification, and there's a question in all the work, which is, what's at risk with language? How can language make 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 us know or push the limits of what is possible? And I feel like with Emily's work, there's, there's this work with uh, and the, the amplification. I think can also be very quiet, but work to amplify these little fissures um, and and silence areas of silence that are not necessarily heard or seen, which of course works works with the prison activism. Um, and I just want to say a couple of things about her new book, um, Exclosures, which I'm really excited about, came out from the Shada Press this year, right? So she has the fortune plan. Um, in which, again, she uh, has, uh, does so much archival research and has so much source material. But it's also really different work in that it's, um, it, 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 it suspends the sort of rapid pace of making and doing that sometimes I think us activists can also get wrapped up in. Um, and um, so it's sort of a good resistance to the very mechanisms of capitalist force that we sometimes ourselves have a hard time resisting. Um, and it, it's a work that perhaps in some ways asks a lot of questions. And a lot of questions are in the final, to have a lot of the final essay. And it is the, it's the question of how to, how, how can we make more in common? How can we make, regain the what's called exposures, play on the enclosures of the commons? And how, what, what's the, the question that she was asking is what is possible and how is it possible? And um, certainly this is a book and Emily's work is a site which helps me feel like there are, that there is much possible and a two things today. Um, the first is just like a very small portion from the appendix to your disclosures, the kind of closing essay that comes with it. And I'm thinking about just because in many ways like this project that I started working on um, got prodded by what by what I was trying to disclosures and sort of where that one didn't get to go. Um, so I just want to open with some of the questions that that essay kind of ends with. Um, and then I'm going to sort of do an experiment. This is a poetic essay piece um, that is very much in process. Um, it also works in a serial form, just coming out of conversations that we were having in Rachel's class a few moments ago in terms of like, there are these um, individual sets of reflections that happen, but they're also <coughs> cross-conversational with one another and allowed to kind of be, communicate and be in dialogue that hopefully like, as they accrue, different things open up even with them and will be led that way. Um, but I am just going to read this very small bit. So this is this 
piece is, I take as a key tenet, the observation of Elizan Escobar, a visual artist and former Puerto Rican political prisoner that, this is Elizan. The political aspect of art is to confront all of reality without ideological permissions and through its own bones, end quote. In the wake of that assertion, however, another set of questions still remains lively and open to investigation, i.e., how can we create and sustain a healthy, exploratory poetics in these terms? How do we insist on keeping our practices risky in ways that actually nurture us as a community, cultivating and supporting an ample, untamped dedication to reciprocity and what does it mean for so many of us to be at sea in these, quote, liquid times, well, next to entirely without, quote, liquid assets? In lieu of that access to material property or security, what other kinds of assets may we seek to build or restore among ourselves, and how much richer by far may we be for that What happens if we very seriously and daily seek to hold our very preservation as a commons, rather than as an how does that change our lifestyles, our daily rituals, our tax files, and our writing practices? If, as the inimitable James Baldwin expresses him, we have to, in every generation, every five minutes, make human life possible, what is that human life possible in In order to extend these inquiries still further into the day-to-day -day political acts, organizing practices, and social transactions of our messy quotidian lives, might we not also be required to ask, how do we acknowledge the very real and often effective survival tactics that so many people have painstakingly developed in order to live through the circumstances in which they find themselves, <coughs> the circumstances in which we find ourselves, while also retaining the analysis and self-reflection necessary to recognize that these very same strategies, constructed in response to targeted neglect and violent may not always be serving us so well in our efforts to create alternatives to those oppressive mechanisms. Having worked so hard in so many cases to build up these psychological and physical self-preservation shields, how can we now be brave enough across diverse communities to lower them in the name of making something different? Is bravery even what is called? Perhaps more aptly, we must be asking, what collective infrastructures or bases of solidarity will be required within and across our various neighborhoods and kinship networks in order to optimize the feasibility of taking such chances and of being mutually vulnerable in such ways? How can we forge these sites of cohesion while at the same time maintaining an acute awareness and analysis of just how unevenly distributed all prior states of precarity have been? How can we freely evaluate together precisely what we can or cannot afford to do slash lose while simultaneously making room for the ongoing presence of incommensurable answers? Just the other week, while caught up in a heated internal debate prodded by these very questions, I found myself rereading certain portions of A Rap on Race, a book which contains the unedited transcripts of a three day long conversation that took place between James Baldwin and Margaret Reed in 1978. That book is totally amazing to you guys also in terms of just like, what is it like to read through a three-page conversation, <laughs> a three-day conversation across a number of pages. Um, on the morning of their final day in one another's company, the following exchange occurs. Baldwin. A great deal of what I say is based on an assumption which I hold and don't always see. You know my theory about people is based precisely on the fact that I consider them to be responsible, moral creatures who so often do not act. What I am demanding of other people is what I am demanding of myself. Me. Yes, but I think you have to expand it to realize that there are things happening on both sides of the lines that are being drawn. All of them. Oh, I know that. I have watched it. I have lived too long and too hard a life and been saved by too many improbable people not to realize that. <laughs> Despite my own multiple encounters with this text, Baldwin's use of that phrase, improbable people, never fails to move me to goosebumps, to haunt my mind with a certain kind of daunting electrical charge and hardworking audience. It reminds me once again that one of the long-term aims of all of our efforts, artistic and active, must be to constantly try to exponentially multiply the number of improbable people who exist in this world, ourselves profoundly. 
improbable caring, improbable alliances, improbable knowledges, improbable kinships, improbable poetics, improbable struggles, improbable couples and tumbles, improbable victories. To pursue the cultivation of whole communities of individuals who are constantly breaking new ground within and beyond the terrains of what has been predicted both for them and of them, both for us and of us. So that's just like a little bit from that one. This, this one is like specifically picking up surveillance, but I think from the angle of trying to investigate that, like both for them and of them, both for us and of us. So um, the piece right now is titled Microfiche, Microfilch, Micromanage, Microfane. <laughs> um, it's trying <laughs> to be like, it's a series of reflections on both experiences of surveillance and resistance to surveillance. And it goes between historical examples from the 1800s and early 1900s to like the very contemporary. Sometimes those are sequenced in a way that follows chronology, often they're sequenced in a way that sort of affects it. Um, I'm just going to read three or four of those reflections. So reflection number one, whose safety and how? In the September 2013 issue of Harper's Magazine, it was noted that the number of Americans who have, quote, top secret security clearance is roughly 1,400,000. <laughs> Elsewhere, art artist and geographer Trevor Kagan has observed that, quote, approximately 4 million people in the United States hold security clearances work on classified projects in the black world. By way of contrast, the federal government employs approximately 1.8 million civilians in the quote, white world. Sometimes security is a high-rolling, ill-advised, glamorous, and dangerous game. Other times, security is a middling and mind-numbing middle-class job, <laughs> operating on the averages of salaries. And still, with far greater frequency, security scarcely even pays the rent or lends one the financial collateral for a monthly Adderall prescription or shoes for the children. In their latest collaborative performance project, um, which this is a, me, uh, the Bay Area based artist Cassie Martin and Byron Peters have taken up the task of scrutinizing the occupation of security in its many contemporary and historical guises asking probing questions concerning just who or what is protected in such roles, and more optimistically, what a complete rollover into an alternate theory or vision of protection could look like. Thornton and Peters call their project the Poet Security Force, and in their words, PSF is a mutual aid society that invites security guards to define that they would like to protect outside of other people's property, and encourages them to quote, Great poetry will happen to another job. Use the report as a creative project. Protect on behalf of all people, even when only assigned to protect the interests of a few. Act vulnerably. Represent their own complexity. Um, so I did this part of the last, just like participated in one of the workshops that they were hosting. They posted the desire for quote security force members on Craigslist as a regular app, jobs wanted app. They paid people by the hour um, and had these kind of amazing discussion circles where that were a pretty improbable configuration of people in terms of how everyone ended in that room and what they were able to really talk about. Um, the application form for a poet's force position as posted under the online temporary employment category of Craigslist includes the questions. How did you learn to be a poet or security guard? What do you think security is? How do you make yourself feel secure? What do you do to make others feel secure? What do you value most in your life in the city of your residence? How would you or do you go about protecting? The answers to these questions are often fitfully impossible to synthesize or to bring into a court. In the day-long workshops which accompany these experiments, participant workers are asked to describe whether that the answers to the so in the day-long workshops which accompany these experiments, participant workers are asked to describe what are you hired to protect in your work ostensibly? And then a second question that says, what are you really protecting? Um, the 
The answers to these questions are often unpredictable and riveting. In fact, I was surprised to find myself replying. As an adjunct professor at a private university, I protect students from the reality of my own precarity and of theirs. Mm -hmm. I protect the illusion that institutional education is still in its majority a liberatory experience and a sustainable one. I falsely present myself as a sustained man. There are strong reasons for doubt and disbelief, and I cover up that doubt outwardly. I flout a confidence which I wrench forth from the air of the room, and contrary to all counterindications. Another woman present slowly describes her job to those of us who are seated around the table. I work in events here, concert halls, stadiums, auditoriums, and large outdoor rooms. I generally work in training. Our task is to collect the cell phones of ticket holders as they enter into the big game celebrity shows. We do so in order to prevent bootleg filming or audio recording from taking place in an attempt to curb the black market availability of such items. It's chaotic and it's stressful because, as you can imagine, no one wants to give up their phones. We just throw the phones into huge bins equipped with a dismal tagging system. As for us, quote, security staff, we are required to sign a waiver as a stipulation for receiving the job at all, which says that we grant full permission to the management company to use our own images to any end they desire, at any time. Our signature qualifies as permanent consent, howsoever and wheresoever those images may appear. Failure to sign this form is caused for immediate termination of the position. The pay is $7.25. Can we call these phototoxic conditions? I.e., occupationally speaking, it looked like what you needed and then it needled you. The facilitators proceed to ask us, what are you afraid to lose? And we fill the whiteboard with replies. There isn't enough room for the magnitude of our outline of fears and concerns. So one of these images was also that whiteboard, which is kind of amazing. Um, a copy of all these different tables, ways of explaining that question. This is what cannot be insured against. This is what eludes the capacity to compensate one for one's losses. In her unorthodox poetic text on drone operations and long distance warfare, author Catherine Taylor writes, this is Catherine Taylor, we long for autonomy from danger. And in order to gain this, we cede our agency to others who will stand in our place, whether they are human soldiers or autonomous weapon systems. Inevitably, the desire for safety creates new danger. It can be tempting to protect our security at any cost, but the cost of security can be us. It can turn justified acts of defense into preemptive acts of tyranny. It can transform defenders into predators. We turn from the drone being a global observer to the one we call the predator. We turn from the sentinel, Karen, and Hermes to the hunter, Avenger, and we watch them perform in scenes of declared combat like Afghanistan, and then watch them restage in undeclared events like Pakistan or Oakland. <clears throat> with newly enhanced properties and features, with the chance of intrusive ransacking ranking very high on the list of inevitable probabilities. If I had a proboscis for every time my safety was turned against me, we wouldn't have a pollination problem in the Northeast. If I had a turntable for every time my safety was turned against others, there would be one motherfucking DJ station on every corner. <laughs>